I'm Kathleen Liebeck, and I'm here today uh, with the New Mexico State Bar Senior Lawyer Division Oral History Project. And I'm here to interview Mr. Richard Civarolo, whom I've known for 30 years. And we were, go we're going to start this morning um, with your early life. You were born in 1917, Gallup, New Mexico, right? Correct. And tell us a little bit about your early life. Well, my folks, my father came over from Italy during the turn of the century, Kathleen, and he came to Gallup to work in the mines. Uh, it's my understanding that he was in the service and there was a, a lot of several t Italian gentlemen that didn't want to go to Africa where they were being sent at that time, so they came over and some of them went to Raton, some of them to Trinidad, and he with several of them came to Gallup and sent for my mother several years later. So she came over with a, a son and a daughter. They settled in Gallup and he worked in the coal mines until his death in the, in the early 30s. Uh, during my youth, of course, uh, in those days, we didn't have all of the facilities and things that we have now. I recall that we had a coal stove. There wasn't any gas available at that time. Uh, as a matter of fact, we even had a uh, outside oven where we made uh, our, where my mother baked breads. And it was my responsibility as the youngest one to see that it was stoked properly. How many brothers and sisters yeah. did you have? Yes, in one of those old-fashioned ovens. And as a matter of fact, we had an outdoor uh, uh, water bathroom because we didn't have a bathroom until later on. But my mother preferred the coal stove, and even when we were able to get gas stoves or gas to, into the house, she wasn't very happy about it. She wanted a good old go. So. But we lived a pretty routine life. We never had an automobile because in those days, shopping in grocery stores were pretty convenient. We could walk to it. But uh, also, I remember buying a loaf of bread for 10 cents. Now you can't hardly buy anything for 10 cents. I, uh, we had our own vegetable garden. We had chickens and rabbits that we raised, and uh, we... I recall delivering newspapers for an early age. I would walk to the railroad station early in the morning and pick up the newspapers and during the winter, and winters were pretty, can be severe in Gallup. I recall standing by the old locomotives and the steam to warm up before I took off delivering my newspapers. I uh, graduated from high school. As a matter of fact, I was active in sports. and. I uh, began working at the Charles Elfield Company for five days a week for fifteen dollars a week. And what was your job? Actually, it wasn't a it wasn't a bad salary in those days. What What was your job? I was uh, loading trucks in the morning, and uh, they had an ice plant. I would uh, cut the three hundred pound pieces of uh, ice into 50s or 25s or 70, whatever they wanted. And then I worked in the, highway, in the hardware department, and I recall very vividly in those days assembling wagons for the Navajos. We'd put them together. They'd come in all disassembled, and we'd put them together. I remember mixing paint. Uh, of course, nowadays, lead, but in those days, you had a gallon of lead and a gallon of paint. Uh, taint and, and you mix your own paint. I also remember handling barbed wire. We sold a lot of barbed wire and it uh, you had to be sort of a experienced at handling that barbed wire because it could be very difficult in lifting them and carrying them. And I always wanted to progress because I realized that in Gallup there wouldn't be a great deal of future. The only type of jobs that were available were either with Charles Elfield Company or Gallup Murphy or the railroad or the highway department, something of this sort. And 
my brother's work for the highway and also for the uh, for the railroad. And when uh, I was in Santa Fe, New Mexico, visiting a friend when Pearl Harbor happened, and I realized that there may come a time when I probably would have to either enlist or they would uh, induct me. At that, right after Pearl Harbor, there was a move on to get the young people in Gallup and elsewhere in New Mexico to volunteer for the National Guard to go over to Bataan. And I remember very specifically that I thought it, everybody thought it was great and quite a challenge, but I was at the age that required my mother's signature and she refused to sign. Uh, unfortunately, most of the Bataan veterans that came out of New Mexico did, didn't make it, but uh, when uh, we became involved in World War II in Germany, I volunteered. And I recall going to Santa Fe and being inducted up there at, at, in, in Santa Fe. And I was in the next week, I was shipped off to El Paso, and I started my Army career. I uh, quickly realized that I would much rather be an officer than an enlisted man, so I took some intelligent tests, and apparently I made a fairly good score because they classified me as a, being officer candidate material. So I went to officer candidate school for six months, and when I graduated, I was a second lieutenant. I was sent to Camp Robinson in Arkansas, and to, I was a platoon officer, and then I became a, a, an assistant battalion adjutant. And that's when I met my wife. She was a secretary in headquarters, and our regiment decided to have a sort of a dance and affair to introduce the uh, officers and to the camp. And my company commander is the only one that had a car, so he was recruited to try to enlist or get some young ladies that might want to come to our dance. So one weekend, he and I got the names of all of the young ladies in the, in the headquarters, thinking that was probably the easiest way to find someone because <laughs> we didn't know anybody. And I recall we, her, Mary's father was a regular army man. And... Uh, he was uh, stationed out of, out of Washington, D.C., and, and we went to her home on one Saturday morning to see if she would uh, be interested in uh, attending our dance. And I recall very well, she was a very attractive young lady, and she came to the door and had shorts on and looked very attractive. So I remember telling Mr. Br Br Captain Bradley, Captain, I don't know about you, but that one's mine. <laughs> and it was a very prophetic utterance, you know. <laughs> but uh, after we were sent to England, and I was an assistant adjutant there in a camp just outside of Liverpool, I made friends with uh, some of the Liverpool officers, I mean, some of the uh, English officers and some of the camp people nearby. And I recall specifically that uh, being so close to Liverpool, they had a great opera house, um, I mean, a great opera. And I enlisted, I bought a membership, and I would go in, and I met some nice people. And from there, we shipped overseas. We went to, we hit Omaha Beach, not on D-Day, but shortly thereafter. And I remember... Specifically, going down a rope, getting into the water, and walking to the beach. And the first thing I recall was at the top of the cliffs on Omaha Beach, the engineers had built a huge sign. The Germans had uh, set what they called bouncing Betty's. Tra uh, uh, 
uh, booby traps. And if you'd walk by within a couple of yards, it would activate them and they would jump. They would spring up about waist high and cause a lot of damage. So they had this huge sign, it was a billboard size, saying, if you get out of this path, you'll get a bouncing Betty up your... And that was very effective in keeping everybody within the path. Uh, as far as uh, being a soldier was concerned, I, I didn't do anything extraordinary, I just... Uh, I, I got my own command, and I was a company commander, then I was a battalion hesitant. Uh, I remember Judge General Patton coming onto the beaches. If you've uh, seen the, the movie General Patton, perhaps you recall the scene where he was talking to all the troops. Well, I was there. And he was a two-star general at that time. And sure enough, he comes wheeling up in his Jeep with his dog and his pistols. And he gets on this uh, platform with a megaphone. And the first thing he said was, I expect every one of you SOBs to get killed. And I turned around to the major next to me and I said, I don't know about you, but he's not talking about me. <laughs> and you know, those, those are the kind of things that you remember. Uh, I, you have my one of my pictures in the in the, the book that I've given you of uh, me on the banks of the Rhine River in Alsace the Rhine in the winter time, which was kind of cold. Uh, we just uh, did what we had to do. Nothing spectacular. I just uh, I remember Saint Lo. Uh, if you've seen the recent movies that they've been running of the war and all. It shows all of the airplanes when they bombarded uh, St. Lowell. It was an unbelievable sight. And I remember it very, very, very well because it was something that one can't forget. Just uh, according to statistics and what they were telling us, that was the largest bombardment during the war ever. There were just hundreds and hundreds of, of uh, bombers coming over and all. And what really struck me is that they were, they had markers, they would drop smoke signals or, or smoke bombs to delineate the lines between the, 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 diff, the Germans and the, and the Americans. And the wind shifted and some of the bombs fell on some of our own troops. And even that was uh, in chronicalized in the newspapers and, and everything else. But after, after that bombardment, it was just unbelievable. Uh, Patton's and uh, tanks were then uh, on, the, on the scene, and the, uh, the, the, the landscape in that area was, was, was pretty level. There were a lot of... Uh, uh, Grapevines and all up. If you, I'm sure you've been to France. You know how mm -hmm. those are. But the 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 French were very. They had their own troops and all, of course. And what rather interested me is to see uh, tanks along the road, rolling down the road with uh, young ladies in them, heads sticking up in the terrains, you know, and. Chicken in cage in, in the cages in the back of the truck of the of the, of the, uh, of the tank. Uh, they know how to travel. Um, I remember Dachau. I remember I wasn't among the troops that took Dachau, but I remember going there shortly thereafter. And I have a photograph that I took myself of the ovens that I have here, and, and uh, I. Uh, it was uh, something that uh, we just couldn't understand. And now with all of the talk about, uh, well, never even happened, just a matter of imagination, I assure you that it was not a matter of imagination and it's unbelievable. As a matter of fact, I, for some reason or other, I picked up a little urn that uh, they would put the, the ashes in a cremated bin. And 
I had it in my knapsack. And it's and when we when we were discharged, I uh, just threw it in my trunk because we had a footlocker. And after I got home, well, it was a, I, there were things I just I just couldn't forget, and I had a hard time sleeping. And one night I got up, picked up that little urn, and walked out in the street and slammed it on the curb and broke it. And after that, I could sleep well. Just those yeah. things that stick with you. Uh, I remember Birch's Garden, beautiful view. It's in. And uh, I remember what, there were some nice things that happened. I remember going through Reims and picking up a truckload of good champagne. And I bought it, I didn't steal it. <laughs> and uh, I was, uh, my headquarters was a nice place for lawyers, for, for, the officers to meet because I always had some champagne. It lasted a couple of months, but it also made a deal with the English because I'd been involved in the, in the Red Ball Express, and they gave me a uh, a voucher for every officer that I had in my battalion, and then I would send them back to Con once every month for one uh, bottle of scotch and. Have Half a bottle of gin, or vice versa, either. So I was uh, always well equipped to take care of my troops as well as my colonel would go hundreds of yards or, or miles just to come and have supper with me sometime. But you learn how to take care of yourself because if you didn't, and I have a sign on my desk there, uh, Captain Rich C. Cirola commanding, that was made by a German prisoner who was my jeep driver, and I kept it, and I have it there as a kind of memento. As a matter of fact, I was going through some of my things at home to sort of prepare for this, and I found my old bayonet. I had a uh, German Luger that I had picked up from an officer, a German officer, and I, geek as a matter of fact, Bob Curtis has it, now he's going to clean it up for me. And I still have my old helmet. Uh, it's amazing how uh, you just put these things away and then suddenly they bring back memories. Uh, I uh, I got hurt during the war. It was not a war injury. I, and as a matter of fact, I don't know how it happened, but when I was discharged, they determined that I had a traumatic cataract in my left eye. And that... Uh, I lived with uh, that very severe cataract for years. I went to school with it and practiced law for a while until I found someone who could remove it and replace it with a lens. Uh, matter of fact, I, they classified me as disabled, so I became involved in veterans affairs. And I, that's why I was uh, commander of the State commander of the disabled American veterans. I thought maybe that would do, I would be able to do something for some of these veterans, but I I've been gone for a couple of years, and Mary and I had gotten engaged before I left. When I came back, I took a troop train from New York to Gallup through El Paso to Gallup, and. She was, her father was a regular army officer stationed in Camp Commander in Utah. And she came from Utah down to Gallup. I got to Gallup one f Friday. We got married Saturday morning. And I started the school next week. We got married on the 10th day of, uh, of November, which will be 62 tomorrow. years tomorrow. Tomorrow, Saturday, That's too. Right. And uh, we uh, didn't have an automobile, but one of my f young friends had an automobile, so he drove us to Albuquerque because I determined, you know, I better get an education. The Army, if nothing else, it certainly 
made me prove myself that I could do something because I found out that, out that I could lecture to troops, I could command troops. As a matter of fact, I have a letter in one of my files for where the inspector general said my company was one of the best companies they ever inspected, and they uh, they may be an offer to stay in as a regular army officer, but that uh, I decided that I needed to get out and do something. So I came to Albuquerque and enlisted, or or, or uh, enrolled in the University of New Mexico on the. I think it was the 12th or 13th of, uh, of November in 1945. We didn't have a place to live, but my brother was living here in Albuquerque, and he was working for the State Highway Department as a chief clerk. So he had a basement apartment, so we stayed in a basement apartment and, until we were able to find a, a place. And the only, in those days, it was very difficult to find any, any uh, living space houses or rents or, or rentals. We found a little place down on South Broadway, believe it or not, and we stayed there for for quite a while. And I enlisted in the, uh, when I uh, enrolled in, in college, I uh, enrolled under the GI Bill, and I was getting $90 a month. Mary went to work so that uh, we could live adequately, and I immediately beginning involved in matters at the university. I decided that I not only did I want an education, but I, I realized that you got to get involved in things if you want to uh, make your presence and also reputation, whatnot. I know I've been asked, well, why? Uh, why did you pick, uh, why did you want to be a lawyer? Well, it's rather interesting how I became a lawyer. <laughs> I always wanted to, I admired our, our, I had a lawyer friend in Gallup. He and I were involved in a um, little, little theater over there, and I became acquainted with him and his wife, and he lived a pretty good life, and I thought, you know, this is not bad. And then, um, my wife, my mother, rather, had a, a, a doctor whom I really admired. I thought he was a great guy, and I wanted to, I thought it might not be bad to be a doctor. But I wanted to go, I had lost my father by then, so I wanted to go, thought it would be nice to go back to Italy and maybe go to school there. I contacted the uh, Italian counselor in Denver, and he cautioned me not to go back to Italy because my father had been in the service and the moment I hit the Italian soil, he said they'd conscript me in the service. So he warned me not to go. So uh, that discouraged me from wanting to be a doctor. When I enrolled in the University of New Mexico, and by the way, it was late in the semester because it was mid-November, uh, They opened the the law school in 1947, and it suddenly occurred to me that, gee, maybe I, did, I ought to make, get a profession because I really didn't know what I wanted to do. And I was working while I was going to school, by the way. I was working as a, in the summertime from the state highway department. As a matter of fact, I helped lay the asphalt on Monal Boulevard <laughs> as an example. And I was also part-time with Charles Eiffel Company, who had a warehouse here in town. And we didn't have an automobile, so Mary and I generally walked. Uh, I decided that I would try to get in, see if I could uh, enroll in law school, so I went over and checked with the dean. And I worked out a deal with him where I could uh, earn both degrees. I would go to, uh, I would work on my my BA uh, during the summertime and go to law school during uh, during the fall and spring. So I did, but I also worked. When I'm going to law school, I remember that 
Joe Woods and I, who later became a, 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 a court of appeal judge, were quite good friends, and he had a car, and I didn't. He used to drive me to school and back all the time. We went to work for Professor Polovard, who was the librarian. We're making a buck ten an hour, and uh, the first law class was in the old stadium. There was one classroom in the library and the uh, in the administrative offices. Whenever there was a football game or anything of any activity on the user stadium, of course, uh, class was dismissed because it would be impossible, to, it was impossible to do any work or anything. I recall that our first class, they were practically all veterans. Uh, we had one young lady, Raquel Marcus. Uh, she did not graduate, but I think you have some photographs. I was able to, uh, I, I become acquainted with the new dean of the law school, and I was visiting her the one day, and I don't think they had any of, of, uh, of much material about the first law class. I had some uh, alumni albums at home, so I dug some of them up and found some photographs of the first class, some photographs of the graduating class, some information about the professors and the students and all, and I made them available to her, and also they're in this book that I prepared. The current dean. You've given, Pardon? You've given those to the current yes, dean. Yes, they're in there. Yes, ma'am. Uh, I became involved in uh, political activities and other activities on campus. I joined a fraternity. I uh, became involved in the Student Senate. I organized the Veterans Association. And by the way, the second class uh, after the, of course, when the, they, they needed additional classrooms. So we were able to work with the people out of Kirtland and had a, a barrack move down for the second year class after the after we, we graduated from the first year class. Uh, actually, we graduated from that barrack when I got my... Uh, then it was LLBs rather than JD. They beca it became a JD later. But uh, I found out that when I went to get, when graduation time came, that I lacked uh, three hours of uh, some basic uh, class for my BA. So I had to arrange with the dean to transfer three hours of my criminal law which <laughs> over so I could get more degrees. And I got two degrees the same night. I, I'm not sure they do that anymore. I don't know. Did but, anyone uh, else in your class get two degrees? <laughs> and I know that. Uh, did Did anyone else in your class get no, two degrees? No, I was the only one. I was the only one. But and I worked part time too. When I was going to law school, I was fortunate in working for Bill O'Sullivan as sort of a clerk, He's and an I became attorney. acquainted with him and with uh, Joe Smith, and uh, with some of the best I got. I learned how to, law school taught me the law. They taught me how to be a lawyer, which is a significant difference. <laughs> and uh, they not only became friends, but when I got to the point where I decided I wanted to practice myself after I graduated, I, uh, I went around some of the big firms in town to check to see if they needed a young lawyer. I remember going to the Rody firm, I remember going to the Modulo firm, and in those days it was Johnson's firm too. And then I decided, you know, let me see if I can make it on my own. If I can't, I don't know how to go to work with somebody. So I talked to Gino Matucci, and he had an office in the old First National Bank building on the second floor. 
and Gina let me share offices with him. And I did my own typing. As a matter of fact, I still have my Underwood typewriter under my desk or back in my office. Uh, I have my first chair I bought. I bought a chair for $5 from a used furniture store downtown and carried it to my office myself. I have it home in my study at home, which is the best chair I still have, <laughs> but it's an old, old, solid uh, uh, chair. Uh, let me tell you about uh, the bar exam. I understand that I was the first student that took the bar exam. Of course, we were the first ones to, to take it here in New Mexico because it, if, if we were the first class. But one of my professors, uh, Professor Weihoffen, who was the contract and uh, uh, one heck of a professor, but very, very strict and very particular. He called me in when he found that we were going to take the state bar, and he said, you know, Civarolo, can you type? I said, yeah, I'm a pretty good typist. Why? He said, well, I think you could have raised your grade at least one point if I could read your writing. So if you can possibly arrange to use the typewriter to take your state bar, you might be better off. Well, through my activities with uh, Disabled American Veterans in New Mexico, one of the fellow members was, was the state treasurer. His wife was the secretary for Judge McGee on the Supreme Court. So one day I was visiting with Bob, and I said, and, and I was discussing this with him. He said, why don't you talk to my wife and have her talk to the judge? thought, that's a great idea. So I pursued it, and sure enough, Judge McGee talked to Lowell Green, who was then the, the chief clerk, and arranged for me to take my typewriter to Santa Fe, and he put me all by myself in the library. So I typed my, uh, my bar exam. And what I recall specifically about it is that every half hour, Lowell will come look over my shoulder, be sure I wasn't cheating, and I finally told him, Lowell, you know, you're kind of bothering me. How in the heck would I cheat? Frankly, I don't know what the hell I'm doing, and I certainly can't go and visit with any of these uh, books in this library because I wouldn't know what to look for and wouldn't do me any good anyway. But I passed. In those days, you took your exam one day, they graded it, and you knew the next morning they posted the those who passed on the, on the, on the Supreme Court chambers and... Uh, and they, we were sworn in. I, uh, I recall that two days after I got sworn in, I tried a case for Gino. And the rules were pretty fresh in my mind. As a matter of fact, my, the, the, my opponent was a, uh, was a member of the Rody firm. And the issue involved a, a miner who was working for um, a a, a, a uh, mine, and the issue was whether he, he was uh, he wasn't getting his, any salary. So he, the, Gina sued for him, and I was trying it for him. Well, during the trial, uh, the lawyer contended that he wasn't entitled to the salary because he was a partner. So I haven't remembered the rules. I I got up and moved that uh, the, the complaint be amended to claim a partnership interest in the mine. And sure enough, we got a partnership <laughs> interest in the mine. That was my first case and my first time I tried it. Well, it, it's a rather interesting how I got involved in doing trial work and uh, insurance work, uh, Kathleen. I, Bill O'Sullivan was a a great criminal lawyer, and matter of fact, he and Joe Smith were probably the first real plaintiffs' lawyers around. They started that, that doing negligence work, and I remember the Kelleher firm had an office in the First National Bank Building too, 
And I recall when I was working for Bill O'Sullivan, but one day he dumped an abstract on my desk and says, give me an opinion. I didn't even know he, what he was talking about. But fortunately, I made friends with uh, Will Kelleher's uh, secretary, and I was chatting with her, and she said, well, you know, we do a lot of that work. Tell me what you need, and I'm sure we got a written opinion. So there was another source of, uh, of friendship that I have, and, and it was my first uh, introduction to title work. Uh, they were just, I didn't like criminal work, because I, the feeling I had that I, I could tell whether they were lying to me or not. And I just, although I realize that being a lawyer, that if you, the, the idea is that they have rights, but when they were just outright lying to me, I just didn't feel as though I could exercise the necessary effort to try to protect them. So I stopped doing criminal work. I tried a, a case for Gino involving an automobile accident, and I won. Next day, the insurance company came by and hired me. That's how I got started doing insurance work. I remember I did my own typing for a couple of years, and I recalled Judge Rogers, district court judge who later became federal judge. He called me in one day and he said, Cibrolo does your typing for you. <clears throat> I said, well, I do all my own typing. I don't have a secretary. He says, well, I suggest you get one part-time because your typing isn't very good. <laughs> so I, Dino let me borrow one of his secretaries part-time. That's how it got started. But suddenly I found that uh, I liked trial work. And it was challenging. It was interesting. Uh, you had to exercise judgment. It wasn't easy. It wasn't very much pay, but I liked trial work. So I got involved in doing trial work, and pretty soon it began. The more cases you tried, the more cases you won, why, the more insurance companies that came by and knocked on your door. But in the meantime, Kathleen, I decided that uh, it was easy for me to get involved in other things, too. I became involved in constant social agencies who the forerunner to the United Fund and I was president of it. I was involved in the Veteran Affairs. I was on the Veterans Service Commission. I um, incorporated the Legal Aid Society. I have the documents in my office. I got interested in the Cancer Society. In those days, they didn't have the beautiful building they have now. Matter of fact, where they are now was the old Bernalillo County Indian Hospital. They uh, made arrangements. To, somehow or other, they began, got involved in, in trying to get a cancer clinic. I was with the Cancer Society for 45 years. I was a lawyer. I was on the national board. I would go back to New York. I helped write the national bylaws. I volunteered my time. I remember carrying a typewriter into the office at the Old Bernalillo County Indian Hospital. It was the first uh, uh, tumor registry in New Mexico other than a veterans hospital. You're the only one I had here. And then a couple of years later when I was a uh, uh, state president of the Cancer Society. I got them a $37,000 grant from the National and bought them one of the first uh, electronic microscopes that, uh, for, the, for the cancer clinic. Uh, matter of fact, someplace in my file I have a photograph that was taken of me by this monster and uh, I got a lot of publicity out of it, and so did the Cancer Society. I didn't much care about myself, but, but I got involved in all those things. And uh, not only were they personally satisfying to me, but I became acquainted with a lot of people that uh, helped me broaden my uh, 
my, my law practice. As a matter of fact, you remember Wayne Wolf. He and I were involved when the developers from New York came here and tied up all that land at Rio Rancho that later became Rio Rancho. Uh, in those days, it was nothing but prairie dogs and sagebrush. Well, that, that was uh, when Wayne and Leroy became yes, your, uh, yes, with your firm. Okay. And Leroy Hanson. Yes. And then uh, Leroy and I were involved in representing the city in the first uh, cable vision, the te television company that came to town. We helped with the agreement with them. When did Wayne and Leroy join the firm? Pardon? Wayne and Leroy, when, when, when I, was I that don't, about? The, the specific date I don't recall, but I remember this is the first time that cable television came to town and needed a franchise. And we were doing some work for the city and Leroy and I, and Leroy worked on it primarily, but it, both of us worked on it. And uh, those are some of the things that we were involved in. But I've got a list of things in my, uh, in my resume there that I've given you that it shows how uh, involved I was. I also participated in uh, bar affairs. I helped uh, start the Lawyers Club. I was president of the Albuquerque Lawyers Club. I uh, was a charter member of the Albuquerque Bar Association. You've spent uh, a lot of time with the um, Medical Review Commission. Well, that was uh, later on when in the, the, plus all of the other committees that I worked on, I worked on quite a few of them. Matter of fact, the one committee I worked on specifically that I'm going to mention later on had to do with lawyer advertising and all. In those days, of course, that was before the famous Arizona case, Supreme Court, that said, you know, lawyers can advertise. Uh, I was in that, I was chair of that committee, and we were trying to see if we couldn't define some limits for lawyers' advertisements. I got a nasty letter from the Yellow Page people saying, we're going to sue you because you're violating lawyers' rights. They have a first amendment right to do what they want. And they, we want their advertisement. It's important to us. And if you try to restrict their advertisement, we're going to sue you. I resigned from the committee. I said, I don't want to do this. Uh, by the way, that's one of the things I'm going to mention later on when, if you ask me about uh, some of the things I like and dislike about the practice of law now. Uh, the, it, it's, it's, I, I've, uh, I've enjoyed all of these efforts. And not only has it uh, really enriched me personally, but I think it's helped to uh, establish a reputation you were a uh, national president of ABOTA, weren't you? Yes, and it also helped me professionally. Uh, it's helped me. I, ha I had uh, some clients that were in the real estate business, and uh, in those days it was so easy to get involved with them as far as investments were concerned. And through my relationship with some of these organizations, when uh, a neighbor of mine started the uh, Western Bank, came to me to help him. I helped put that together, helped me get the charter. And later on, it, uh, it's been one of the best investments I've ever made. In addition, uh, I was on the Board of Directors and General Counsel from 1973 until 2000 when they sold to Compass uh, Bank. It was a great introduction to business. I conducted every corporate meeting, stakeholder meeting the bank had except one, and I was ill at that time. So it was. Uh, it it also helped me in business. Uh, the Bell Company right now. Saul Bell came to me. 
in the early 60s. And uh, I incorporated him with his uh, company. I had a little share of stock. And now, of course, he's got 800 em uh, about 400 employees, and uh, I think he, they've got an $80 million a year business. I helped them get started. I wrote their all of their bylaws, and and and, uh, and I represented them for years. Of course, I'm, I'm not involved in that kind of business anymore. But uh, uh, and and it's through simple relationships. I remember the way I met. Uh, you know, a lot of these things that happen. It's uh, you got to be on the you got to be a little bit lucky. You got to be at the right spot at the right time. And honestly, many of the quote achievements I might have made or contacts I had were being at the right spot at the right time. In those days, it was easier to get started without a bunch of cash than it is now. But I also, business-wise, I learned real quickly that credit was important. So I went down to the Albuquerque National Bank, which was down on the corner of 2nd Street in the Central, and borrowed money, kept it for a month, didn't spend it, paid off my debt, used the same money, and created credit. And later on, it was very important in my getting started in my business when I needed to, to do that. But. Uh, that's one of these things you learn when you grow up in a family like I did, because uh, what we had, uh, we earned ourselves, and we made it. Uh, we were happy and didn't realize it, it wasn't the idea of buying it because you wanted it. We, we bought it because we needed it. Uh, that's what I've been trying to teach all of my kids and friends is don't buy it just because you want it. Buy it if you need it, because you're better off if you do. Uh, fortunately, over the years, I've had uh, some great associates. I've had some intelligent associates. We've had some great staff. I recall specifically Gino and I talking Peter Domenici to getting involved in politics. And we helped finance to get started, which I think is uh, probably one of the greatest things that a politician could have done for New Mexico for all that he's done for. All. You know, and his son Pete was with us for a while. Do you remember that? Yeah. Okay. Uh, let's take a break. Okay. 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 Um, Kathleen, you've asked me about some of the activities I participated in, in the Bar Association. I uh, referred to my resume, and I noticed that uh, I'm just going to comment because it's easier from here. I would serve as chairman of the New Mexico State Bar and Authorized Practice of Law Committee from 69 to 77. I was a member of the New Mexico State Bar Grievance and Ethics Committee, 78 to 81. I have been chairman of the New Mexico Medical Legal Grievance Committee since 1984 and still am. I have been chairman of the New Mexico Medical Review Committee since 1983 to the present. I have been chairman of the New Mexico Medical Liaison Committee since, since 1983. And I'll come in about those a little later because I, I think that uh, this is uh, something that has been worthwhile for not only for the state bar but for the medical society and also for the courts later on. What exactly did you do in those well, liaison positions? And the, the liaison committee was established as a uh, sort of a hearing board between the medical society and the uh, State Bar. Uh, we met quite frequently in discussing issues such as, rather than being controversial 
and, and uh, argue with one another, especially with the type of legislation and the Medical Malpractice Act. We would meet and discuss those things. As a matter of fact, I have a nice letter from Steve Durkovich, who uh, you know is a rather well-known plaintiff's lawyer, uh, setting out some of the things that the liaison committee has done, and how it's uh, it's been a forum for rather than fighting in court, we meet, and I've been chairman of it since uh, since eighty since eighty four and resolve a lot of the issues rather than be controversial. And uh, the equal number of uh, plaintiff's lawyers, defense lawyers, and physicians on it, and it's worked out rather well. Uh, rather than, uh, we don't do any, any lobbying at all. We're not permitted to it. We, don't, we wouldn't want to do it anyway. Of course, the plaintiff's bar has a, a, a lobbyist, and, and, and they have their own interests. But this liaison committee has been able to alleviate all of these problems rather than coming out in public or before the legislature. We've talked about the individual problems as, as an example. There was an issue a couple of years ago about the cost of insurance and, and the, the, uh, the uh, limit as far as recovery is concerned. I arranged to have the president of the insurance company come into town and visit with us and set out what they're doing and what the risks are involved and, and uh, the different risks as far as the different professions are concerned. And that's the kind of thing that we do. We don't meet every year. We only meet when it's necessary. Uh, the other committees were set up for uh, circumstances such as when a lawyer complains about a doctor, a doctor complains about a lawyer. If they file a formal complaint, comes to me, I look at it. If I can't resolve it, then we have a committee meeting. And we've been able to really, if, if you just think that in the past 10 or 15 years, there haven't been very many controversial issues between the physicians and the lawyers and the courts, because we, for, frankly, some of these committees have been able to resolve these things. And uh, uh, the, the, the most uh, important committee, however, is the Medical Review Committee. That was uh, <clears throat> that's a statutory provision that requires, before a lawsuit can be filed in court against a, a pra medical practitioner who is qualified under the Act, and I want to accent that because they have to qualify under the Act, uh, they must submit the petition before the Medical Review Committee. And <clears throat> the statute provides that three lawyers and three physicians serve on this committee. The State Bar has always cooperated as a matter of fact, some of us helped write this, this, this Medical Malpractice Act, so we realized the involvement of the, of the State Bar. In 2006, this committee had 250 volunteers, which is the largest committee in the, in the state, in, in the, uh, numerically anyway, in the State Bar. But what it does is that it... Uh, Whenever a petition is filed, the, there's a specific procedure and the policy that we prepared that they must follow and send all of the records and all to the to this panel who review the who have a hearing and the, they then vote as to whether or not there's probable cause and whether or not there's there's injury. I'm, I'm, I'm just paraphrasing. And actually, statistically, and, and this, um, I, I have a, a document here uh, <clears throat> that I prepared in 2006 when this committee received the award as from the uh, New Mexico State Bar as the uh, outstanding. Section Committee Award. 
uh, I went back and looked at my records and prepared some statistics as far as the type of work that lawyers are working and the doctors because there's three of each. And I, I was able to find that uh, since the inception of these Medical Review Commission by statute, and this was in 19206, since then there have been others, uh, there have been 3,180 panel hearings. But when you break that down, the three lawyers and three doctors, and they look at the material, they travel to the panel hearing, and they spend four to five hours on each, that relates to 9,540 uh, the attorneys and doctors who have volunteered over those years, because you need six for each panel hearing, and that's between 38,000 and 47,000 hours of their time that they devoted. But the significant number of cases that have been resolved without lawsuit and without uh, the involvement of, of, the, of the judge and the jury and the judicial system have been extremely significant. As a matter of fact, we're one of the very few states that has a Medical Malpractice Practice Act. And I've gotten the correspondence and comments from uh, different states. As a matter of fact, just a year or so ago, I had a judge in Texas contact me and want, wanting to discuss with me and get copies of what we've done and all because they apparently they were thinking about doing something similar. But the it has functioned quite well because it, it, it lets the plaintiff's lawyer, among other things, find out whether he's got a case or not. And then it also has the medical practitioner know whether he's got a problem or not. And it's amazing the number of uh, cases that are either dropped or settled uh, because of this process. And it's a uh, it has uh, smoothed the relationship between the medical profession, the legal profession, and certainly not overburdened the courts. And uh, I, I hadn't really looked at all of the efforts that they had put out, and that's a significant number of hours and a significant number of lawyers and doctors involved. My function has been the these volunteers, they submit their, the, when the case is filed, the staff that's set up by the medical society, they are on contract with the chairman of the Medical Review Commission who's appointed by the Supreme Court. They review these petitions and then they send out a card to those volunteers to see who would volunteer to serve on any one particular panel. Then they follow up, and after they get a certain number of names, they submit them to me to select six. And the reason we select six is, is although only three serve, because the the parties have the right to disqual to uh, to, to disqualify, or uh, some of them are, have conflicts and can't show up. And this is true also of the doctor. What is rather interesting, and what I've been trying to resolve and haven't been able to, as far as the lawyers are concerned, is that the doctors get $50 for each hearing, plus they get some credit to the, C to the CLE. Uh, I've been trying for the last several years to see if the, perhaps the lawyers who spend uh, all this time and effort uh, might be able to get some pro bono hours. Uh, so far, I haven't been able to convince the state bar that maybe they're entitled to something like this. But to me, and, and I, 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 I've given you a copy of what I did, is being unable to, to correspond with each member of this committee over the years, I uh, took it upon myself to publish a letter in the state bar bulletin telling them what they had done and thanking them as far as I was concerned, as far as the state bar was concerned, 
and point out to them all the work and the hours that they've spent. And to me, that's one of the accomplishments as far as I'm concerned, because I've, and, and you know, I've, I've spent a few hours at this too, over the years. Mm -hmm. And the policies and all that are in effect, I helped prepare them. As a matter of fact, one of the first set of policies that were prepared, uh, uh, Jim Parker, who is now a federal judge, was a practicing lawyer, and so was uh, Dean Franchini. They were on my committee, and, and, and that's some of the things that we've done. Mm -hmm. But this, to me, is, has been one of the uh, better things that I've accomplished as far as being a lawyer is concerned. It, as a matter of fact, several years ago, the State Bar awarded me a special award for the type of work that I've done. To my knowledge, it's the only award that any medical society has ever given to a lawyer. You mean the medical society gave you the award? The medical society yeah. gave it to me, yes. I mentioned it in here. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But uh, to me, this has not only been <clears throat> worthwhile to the state bar, but it's, but it's been worthwhile to the medical society and certainly to the, to the citizens of the state of New Mexico and the judiciary because it's, been, it's not only had a tremendous uh, uh, effect financially, but, but also uh, Certain had it stopped from overburdening the the court system, right? And it's 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 worked rather well. And it, it, it was an early form of alternative dispute resolution. Yes. Yeah. You want to take uh, um, when we start on here? Do you want to talk about a boat a little bit and then the yeah. cases? Okay. Okay. <clears throat> All right. Now no, wait until. Right. Are we ready? Okay. We're back on uh, the uh, on the camera. So you were going to tell us a little bit about your involvement with the BOTA, the American okay. Board of Trial Advocates. Kathy, in addition to being involved in matters with the State Bar of New Mexico, I've, uh, I have I belong to several national organizations, such as the American College of Trial Lawyers, and that's an organization of trial lawyers. Only two percent of trial lawyers in the country belong. I belonged for a number of years. As a matter of fact, I was state chairman at one time. But in addition, I got involved early in an organization called American Board of Trial Advocates that is an organization that rather than being either plaintiff or defendant, it includes both. But in order to, be, to qualify, you have to have X number of juror trials to a conclusion. And... Uh, I got involved in that uh, through some cases I had with lawyers from California because that's where it really got started. And I became interested because uh, of some of the things they stood for. They stand for jury trials. The Seventh Amendment requires a jury trial, which is now being disregarded by a lot of people. And in order to qualify, an associate is... 20 trial lawyers, 20 trial to a conclusion, and then 50 is the next rank, and a diplomat is 100. I have 100. I've been a diplomat for a number of years. And by the way, at one time, it didn't take a million dollars and six months to get ready for a trial. It just wasn't done that way, and I can relate to that later on in, in, when we visit here. But I, I became interested in many of the projects that they were doing, and after working with them on a number of the committees, I became national president. And uh, I assure you that some of the finer plaintiffs and defense lawyers in the country uh, belong to this organization because they have established what they call a, a circle of uh, a, a... I've forgotten the type of circle, but... It has a prestige in that they meet with Congress once a year and they go back to the Judiciary Department and discuss all these problems the lawyers have and all. And in the ends of court, matter of fact, I was at a meeting when we, back in Washington, D.C., when the American Board of Trial Advocate uh, contributed $10,000 to the ends of court to get started. The local ends of court, I was instrumental in getting that started. What do they do? 
here. Tell um, us about what they do. Well, they it, it's uh, they try to get law students, lawyers, and judges together and discuss types of problems that they have. And it's sort of a forum, and uh, the, they generally have a, a meeting with the, with the principal speaker, and they discuss subject and topics. It's been very interesting and very, uh, very educational, too. I have not been active in it. I was instrumental in getting it started here, but uh, I, I think it's still functioning, and I know that uh, nationally it's quite uh, worthwhile. One of the uh, uh, things that uh, the American Board of Health Advocate has undertaken recently that has gotten a lot of publicity is is uh, mock juries. As a matter of fact, we here in Albuquerque and in New Mexico, uh, interestingly enough, when we started a board in New Mexico, Jim Toulouse and I were the first two members. And I volunteered to treasure and I'm still treasured today. Uh, we sponsored the mock jury trial at the University of New Mexico, and uh, all of the, since the team here was uh, rather the, the, the winning team here, we had them all at a dinner party and gave them a, an award. Uh, just to recognize them. We're now trying to get involved, and they're going to have a, a district team competition here in Albuquerque Nick, in, in January or February, and we're trying to get the, uh, some of board of members and others to volunteer as judges. And it's, it's, a, it's a good accomplishment for uh, students, and also uh, Teaches them somehow what lowering is about, and also good for the judges and, and the and the attorneys who volunteer as a, as a, to assist them in training for the mock jury trial. That's just one of the things we do. But it was indeed a pleasure being national president of it because uh, I, I try to visit every chapter in the in the state. I mean, in the nation. And I found out that it was almost impossible to do, <laughs> but uh, they they have excellent uh, CLEs. Continuing and, legal education. Yes, and in addition, they pick beautiful places to go. Oh, that's good. As a matter of fact, uh, I recall <clears throat> going to England, going to the Inns of Court meeting with the judiciary or so-called judges in, the, in London, going to Ireland. And at that time, the <clears throat> ambassador to Ireland was a member of a board from San Francisco, so we were all guests of the ambassador. Uh, I recall going to Hong Kong where we met with the British uh, uh, bar there before the, jet, the Chinese took over. Uh, we toured China with members of the bar. Uh, well, last year, they had a meeting in uh, in Florence, uh, and the year before, or maybe last year, rather than two years ago, they met in Florence. Last year, they had a meeting in in some some place in Africa. You know, they 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 go to wonderful places, and and as a member, I've been able to do a lot of traveling I wouldn't have done otherwise, among other things. But I've met some wonderful, wonderful people. And really, you know, uh, basically lawyers are pretty good people, honestly. Uh, they may be controversial, but still they like one another and they get along. Uh, that, that, that to me has been one of my favorite organizations because of the friends that I've made and the things that I've been able to assist on, not necessarily accomplish, but assist with. Uh, you know, in uh, the state bar has awarded me with the distinguished bar service in recognition of the long-term commitment to the bar services and significant contributions to the legal profession. 
But in addition, I've got my first one in 69, but since then I've gotten one 71, 86, and 97. So I've gotten four of those. In uh, 1976, I got a special award for outstanding work in improving the status and image of the legal profession and the administration of justice. You know, <clears throat> it's surprising how people remember things, Kathleen. When uh, <clears throat> the firm published in the Bar Bulletin that I'd been practicing 57 years, <clears throat> I was surprised at the number of people who wrote me and quite a number of judges. And every one of them had nice things to say, <laughs> which made me feel good. I've got some of them here. I don't necessarily think they belong in the book, but they're certainly going to keep me in my file. But, uh, uh, you know, in, in uh, some of the other things I've done as far as uh, the, I've been president of the state of the defense lawyers here in New Mexico. I've gotten an award from them as dis distinguished service. And surprisingly enough, this year, you know, Joe Rail and his son established an award called the Rail Circle of Honor for New Mexico trial lawyers. They have a space at the bar center with the name and photographs of these lawyers that they pick. I think they pick two a year. But Jerry um, Rail called me up and wanted to know if uh, if I if they could put me on that list. And so I said, sure, as long as it doesn't cost me anything. So, and uh, that's just another award I got. But to me, it's just another recognition. Uh, Would you like to uh, talk a little bit about some of the significant cases that you remember? Yes, uh, I'm thinking of cases that not only were kind of interesting, but also that might have made some law in New Mexico. Uh, I, I've, uh, among the cases I've tried, and by the way, I've tried cases in almost every jurisdiction in New Mexico. And if you remember, you and I tried a nice one down in Roswell once. <laughs> uh, the, uh, one of the cases I remembered, it's just like, it's a matter of record. It's Bernadette Anaya versus St. Vincent Hospital in the blood bank of New Mexico. The reason I remember that is because it was the first HIV case in New Mexico that I'm aware of. And it was a blood bank, blood donor system situation with uh, <clears throat> a concern that uh, the young lady who gave birth uh, had been subjected to a blood transfusion that might have been HIV invested, uh, infected. <clears throat> it, uh, I learned all about HIV. I'd never heard of the word before. What and year was that? In the, in the early 80s. And uh, to my knowledge, it's the first HIV case in the state of New Mexico that related to that. Uh, I recall reading For Whom the Bell Tolls, which is a book about HIV and how it started and, uh, and progressed and one of the problems and some of the problems it created. But uh, that to me was a sort of a milestone as far as HIV is concerned, the blood bank. And it, uh, it also uh, encouraged the blood bank system to, uh, to be a little more strict as far as their, their uh, treatment of the blood was concerned. Uh, I was also involved in the early 80s with the I-125 cases here I represented St. Joseph's Hospital that were the first type of radiation cases that I'm aware of in this area. Uh, it was a treatment of men with cancer, prostate, the cancer, the cancer of the prostate with um, I-125 seeds and <clears throat> They utilized a computer in order to determine 
the number of rads as they say to 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 uh, for the life of the of the uh, seed, and there was apparently a malfunction in the type of computer, and if the if the results of the seed after they determined the number of rads that was delivered didn't reach a certain level, they would give external beams. And because of the error, the external beam they gave far exceeded what they should have been. And we had 18 men that were subjected to this that uh, for different results, some of them resulted in death. But uh, I represented St. James Hospital from doing all of those. As a matter of fact, it took up to about three years of my life. But it was a fascinating uh, experience. And <clears throat> it was, uh, everybody was blaming everybody else from the person who prepared the, the computer to the hardware they bought to the advice they were getting as far as the, the doctors that were, uh, uh, that the radiologists that were inserting these seeds, plus the urologists who were, they were the doctor for the patients. And uh, it, it, was, it was a very interesting matter as far as the, the, that was concerned, but it also got some national attention, unfortunately, because of the radiation that was, in, that was involved. But it was a, it uh, resulted in better techniques, it resulted in uh, uh, better treatment as far as any patients were concerned. As a matter of fact, uh, I went back to Lowell Anderson uh, back in New York to, for some experts. And as a result of my contact, I represented him in several cases here in New Mexico later on. But those cases are cases that I think were significant as far as treatment of patients are concerned, and also the development of techniques and the, and, and the new type of, a, of, a, of, a, of a instruments in delivering them. I, uh, I had also an interesting case, and one of the reasons I remember this one is because of what happened during and after the case. It's styled Frank versus Dr. Zukal in St. Vincent's Hospital. I represented the hospital, and Brand Miller represented Dr. Zukal. He was a um, general practitioner, and uh, this young lady gave birth to twins, and one of them did, did not live, so she filed a lawsuit against the doctor and the hospital. Uh, <clears throat> I represented the hospital, and as I said, ran represented the, the physician. They hired a uh, expert out of California to testify because they couldn't find anybody locally to do it, and. They had they used one of the nurses from the University of New Mexico as as, as one of the witnesses for the plaintiff. Uh, I want to tell you something about the case because to me it was significant. <clears throat> the nurse that testified was one of these very specific type of persons that if it wasn't written, it didn't happen, you know. And she, I could tell that she left the wrong impression on the jury. And when the expert, when the plaintiff put the expert on, they put him on out of place because he was, he was charging them a thousand bucks a day, and the the plaintiff was on the the stand, and he interrupted, took her off the stand, put the expert on. When the expert was finished, the plaintiff wisely didn't call his witness back on the stand, because all she did was cried for four hours. Rand Miller got up to, to cross-examine her, and I called for a recess and told him, don't ask her a question, Rand, because they're primed for you. 
since they've closed their case, as far as he's concerned, leave her alone. I sent my expert, my, my nurse, home. She was outside as a witness. And I got up and said, Your Honor, we have no question to ask this. And you could have heard a pin drop in the courtroom. My closing argument, I told the jury, how'd you like to have this nurse take care of you? You were sick in the hospital. And the jury actually burst out in the laugh when I said, Brian, we got him. You know, <laughs> sure enough, we got a defense verdict. But what was important, by the way, Carl Butkus was second chair in that case. But what I remember specifically about it is the doctor was so pleased that he took the whole jury out to the palace bar and bought them a drink, <laughs> which had never happened to me before. But in addition, the 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 former of the jury got up and toasted the the attorneys, and I told Carl Butkus, Carl, you better relish this because this isn't going to happen again during our lifetime. You know, that was just one of the cases I remembered. One of the other cases that I recall because of what was involved was Ogaz versus Alabama Freight Lines. It's a case that happened down in Lubbock that I, uh, Lordsburg that I tried in Lordsburg. Uh, it was a truck pickup accident where two young men, the Ogaz brothers, were killed in the, in the truck and uh, in the pickup, and they found a case of beer in the in the, uh, in the pickup. And the question is to fault, you know, and in the mortuary they took blood from them and tested out the alcohol. Well, it was my duty to relate the amount of alcohol in the blood in the dead body, bring it back to, time, to the time that, uh, that the accident happened. So I hired a toxicologist from the Veterans Association, from the Veterans Hospital, and flew him down to Lordsburg and put him on. And we were able to relate the amount of alcohol that was in the bloodstream the time of the accident back. So to my knowledge, it's the first time, it's the first time I'd ever done it. And it was interesting trying to get it done. But uh, uh, it, it, it was a rather a fascinating case and we finally settled it out for just to get rid of it. But what was also interesting about it is our principal witness was a postal truck driver from Mexico, who supposedly spoke only Spanish. So we put him on the stand, and of course with a translator, interpreter, and it took us almost all day for his testimony. But when, he, when he, I discharged him, he gets up to the, he walks up to the judge and he says, Judge, can I go home now in perfect English? But in addition to that, he walked down the jury box and shook hands with every one of the jurors, you know, <laughs> I thought, well, I better make a note of this because it's never happened to me before. But uh, that's one of the reasons I remember the case. Uh, another case style, Archer versus Roadrunner Trucking Company, the reason I, I uh, remember that case is because uh, it was a um, case where the wife sued for loss of consortium because of injuries her husband had sustained and he was for which he received workman comp. And there's a court ruling that he, she was not entitled to loss of consortium because the injury had gone to the, it had been compensated under the Workman Comp Act and that was exclusive, which is the matter of law in New Mexico too. Uh, another type, another case that to me was significant in medical malpractice was Goffey versus Farmer Seal and Dr. Burris in Presbyterian Hospital. I represented the doctor. This was a case where the, um, the Mr. Goffey, the patient, had a intestinal obstruction. And in order to relieve the obstruction, the doctor used mercury in a, in a, in a balloon and he inserted it into the mouth, into the intestine, to relieve the, the, the obstruction. In pulling it out, the, the balloon burst, 
and he ingested the mercury. Uh, the people in, in, in the hospital attempted to relieve him of the, of the mercury by putting him in a certain position on the operating table and pounding his back and all. He sustained a heart attack. So he sued the manufacturer, former seal, he sued the doctor, sued the hospital. And <clears throat> the reason I remember it is because the plaintiff, who, who by the way was Jim Toulouse, had an expert from Washington testify as to the standard of care. I had Dr. Sims, Governor Sims's brother, who was a well-known doctor here as my expert. Uh, at that time, the standard of care in New Mexico as far as medical malpractice was a strict locality rule, period. I contested the use of the, of the out-of-state expert on the basis that that wasn't compliance with our strict locality rule. Judge Franchini agreed with me. But he says, I think it's wrong. Why should the standard care of practice medicine be different in Albuquerque and elsewhere? But that's the Supreme Court ruling, and you're right. I hope somebody appeals this and it, to show whether I'm right or not. Uh, <clears throat> sure enough, uh, he granted my summary judgment, our motion to dismiss. Uh, it was appealed. The Supreme Court reversed, and now the standard of care is, you know, whether you get an expert from New York, they're making differences. That's the way they practice medicine, and I think that's right. But up to then, it was a strict uh, standard of care and locality rule. But to me, that changed the, the standard of care for the best. Uh, I've got some of these... Um, Radiation cases are, uh, made some significant law because they dealt with fraudulent concealment as to the time that the, that the statute limitations ran <clears throat> from uh, uh, the date of occurrence or from the date of discovery or what, and the Supreme Court said from the date of discovery or could have discovered with reasonable diligence, which I think is the law now and probably appropriate too. <coughs> I recall a case involving a Centennial Development Company, and that's reflected in some photographs in that uh, binder where Leroy Hansen and I went down to the bottom of this mine in Grants, about 1,500 feet down, which was a, an experience in itself. Uh, <clears throat> this young miner, or this young engineer, had been working there about two weeks and went down to the bottom of this mine supervising the building of the shaft. And in building the shaft, they would use uh, uh, tiles, uh, 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 wooden tiling, to block off the walls so that they wouldn't fall on the, on the, under the ground. And while they were doing this, he goes down to inspect it. He puts his head down underneath to look up and see if there was a, what would, whether the rocks were, in, were intact. One of them slipped and fell and killed him. So they sued the developer, they sued the mine and all, and we represented the the Centennial Development Company that was building more. So we tried it in Gallup. I had uh, Joe Holland is, uh, was assisting us in putting it together, and I had him build a, um, a shaft in front of the jury. <laughs> Show how it was done and the fact that what he had done in the... Uh, and, and we and, and I got a defense verdict, by the way. And one of the letters I've got in there is from s development company saying, you know, how great a lawyer I was and all. Of course, if I'd lost it, I probably wouldn't have gotten it. <laughs> but nevertheless, I remember because of the type of case and the fact that Joe went down to the bottom of the shaft with us to take some photographs, but the water was so it was just like a rainforest, and uh, he ruined his camera. And we had to put on special gears to go down. And uh, I can appreciate 
what my father had to put up with when he was a coal miner. In those days, they had mules hauling it out. It was hand-picking all. But uh, because of, of, of the conditions down there, I remember telling Leroy, Leroy, I don't know how much these miners are making an hour, but it's sure whatever it is is not enough. And uh, I, re I remember the case because of, of the photographs and the fact that Leroy and I were together. Uh, the first case, plaintiff case I ever tried was style Morris, Morrison versus Rody. It's in the reports. It's an accident between a truck and a um, bus near uh, the, the Arizona state line in New Mexico. And Morrison was Gina's client, and I tried it for a plaintiff. But uh, some of the things that happened during the trial, uh, I got a plaintiff verdict in, in, in the early 50s for $60,000, which was a hell of a lot of money in those days. But the problem we had is that Mr. Morrison was quite a character, and uh, unfortunately I found out he liked to drink a little booze. He sells his interest in the lawsuit. <laughs> but uh, Rody was the uh, the uh, Ray was appointed as the guardian of the, of the estate, and that's why he's the name part of it. But some of the things that happened, I I, I want to put it a record. But uh, we were late in getting started one morning. And the principal driver, his son was driving at the time of the accident because his father was sleeping. Well, the reason his father was sleeping is because I think he was drunk. But I had put them up in a motel here in town. And fortunately, he wasn't the one who was driving at the time. But nevertheless, he was, uh, he's the one that was uh, uh, charged with the, with the operation of the truck. Uh, he didn't show up for trial one morning, so I sent the adjuster out to find out why. An hour later, he brought him into the courtroom, and during a break, he told me, he said, you know, uh, I had to wake this guy up, but in addition, we had a problem. Did you know he had a glass eye? And I said, no, I didn't know he had a glass eye. He had an authority to drive. He had a permit to drive. Well, he said, not only that, but he dropped the damn thing, and it shattered, and we had to put it together. It was now sitting in his head, and he's on the stand, you know. Well, uh, since he wasn't the driver, I figured, you know, I don't have the responsibility of informing the court all this stuff. Let them find out themselves, because his son was running the driver at the time of the accident. But can you imagine my sitting there for a whole week with one of my clients sitting at the table with, no, with, with, with a glass eye patched up with glue in his head during a trial. Don't ever experience that. <laughs> and I, and I, was a, I was a plaintiff, and I got $60,000. It was appealed. It was sustained in the Supreme Court. And in the meantime, Mr. Morrison had sold his interest for, for cash value, you know. Um, would you like to, are there any other uh, significant cases, or can we move on maybe to your... Pardon? Can we move to some other uh, topics that, um, or are there other cases you want to discuss? Well, uh, just let me give you a list of them. A Hotel of Distinction, West Incorporated versus City of Albuquerque. That, to me, is a significant case because it involves the Hyatt Hotel. Uh, the city had an agreement with the Hyatt Hotel people to develop the hotel site as part of the, uh, the, the uh, uh, convention center. Uh, the the uh, uh, Hotel of Distinction, which is part of the Hilton Hotel, filed a suit against the city contending that the arrangement that they'd made violated the state constitution against the uh, donation. And the city hired me to defend them. Matter of fact, Jim Woodland and I handled it. And we had, we were, the, the time constraint for the agreement 
was uh, almost over. If we had about two weeks' time, or it would have terminated. And they were in the process of building it. They dug the ground out, and, uh, and, 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 and that was over 500 Marquette, if you remember. Uh, we had a hearing in our uh, one of our conference room with this table uh, one Saturday afternoon because we needed to, to get a decision. Judge Deaton was the judge, and he ruled in our favor, and they appealed it the next the next Monday. Uh, because of the time constraint, I had to go to the Supreme Court and, and try to get them to accelerate the decision. The decisions in the books, they upheld us, and so hadn't been for that, maybe the, the uh, Hyatt Hotel wouldn't be there, because that's what they tried to stop. They didn't want any competition. Uh, I had a, there's another case, it's Red River Ski Area. I tried it in Taos, we, Lee Hansen and I did. During the summertime, you know, they, they had the ski tow for visit for, for, for uh, uh, tourists, trainer for visitor viewing. Uh, two young ladies from Oklahoma were going up, and this young man was coming down, and unfortunately he'd been drinking. He tried to, at one of the the posts where they passed, he attempted to jump out of his uh, c c car into their car and fell and broke his back. So he sued the ski people, and Leroy and I defended him in Santa Fe. And the reason I remember it is because the during the the trial that went it lasted for two weeks. We went one Saturday. We were going to go to the jury Saturday afternoon. The judge let the jury go out to, to lunch. When they came back in, one of them was so drunk he couldn't sit in the jury box. So we had to postpone and everybody agreed for the jury to come back on Sunday to deliberate. That particularly what I remember. But some of the actions by the, the, the attorney handling that case, that, uh, that was very significant in the case. But. Uh, and, and we only got stuck for twenty thousand dollars, so to us it was a victory. But it was a, it was an interesting case. I had uh, Joe Holland take the actual. Joe Holland was an investigator, uh, right? Take the take the uh, the ski lift, put it in the jury room, and um, put it in the, in the take it in the tr in the uh, in the courtroom with a crane, and it was so heavy it almost, it almost fell through the floor in the old courtroom in Taos. But uh, uh, there's, there's several other cases uh, that, that I thought might uh, be of some interest, but uh, uh, they, they all relate to medical malpractice and making the statute limitations and uh, whether or not wrongful death uh, involved a uh, a viable fetus, whether the legislature intended that viable fetus being entitled to recover the Wrongful Death Act, and the Supreme Court in that case said yes, it did. That Salazar versus St. Vincent Hospital. <clears throat> Those are just some of the cases uh, that I've had and have tried. Uh, uh, some of them are more interesting than others. I remember the one you and I tried down in Roswell, where the guy wanted two million dollars for a jury trial. I remember, and uh, we were successful. But uh, um, Richard, I think you could probably talk another several hours about cases yeah, that you've had that yeah. are interesting. Let, let me. Uh, you know, you had asked me in, in, in about. Uh, my feeling about the practice of law and how things have changed. You know, when I started practicing law, it was rather simple. There wasn't very much discovery. There wasn't uh, the deposition was not nearly as in detail they are now. The rules were very simple. I remember going and trying cases with, uh, you know, one or two files, and that was it. And the reason I pile up so many jury cases is because if it lasted more than a week, that was an extremely long jury. <clears throat> but I'm a, 
I've seen the law practice change so radically that to some extent I, I feel concerned as to where, where we're going. Yeah. Let me just uh, quote from a uh, article that appeared in the Experience magazine I get from uh, State Bar, I mean from the Bar Association. And he says, when our generation was admitted to the practice of law... Who are you quoting? I'm, I'm quoting uh, uh, the, the president of the, of, of the ex magazine of the uh, experience, which is part of the uh, American Bar Association. Ah, okay. And the president's name is Theodore A. Cole, K-O-L-V. It really, it, I think, reflects my feeling, too. When our generation was admitted to the practice of law, we joined what was then a respected legal profession, comma, a profession that was dedicated to the resolution of disputes between members of our society or the guardians of society in their engagements to the, to, so that disputes would be averted. Unfortunately, over the years, we are told that we are no longer a profession but a business. If that be the case, I think we're doing a very poor job because our product costs too much and takes too long to be delivered. Our legal press, press rates members of the bar not by the accomplishments of resolution or, or resolving complex problems, but rather on the amount of earnings they make. Tools such as discovery, which were created in order to assist in the resolution of disputes, have become a weapon rather than an aid in the resolution, which I certainly agree with. Disputes are settled not on the merits of either party's position, but on the cost of resolving a dispute. And at the bottom is a cartoon with a lawyer talking to a possible client saying, you have a pretty good case, Mr. Pitkin. How much justice can you afford? And unfortunately, I agree with the matter of rules. Every time you pick up a bar bulletin now, there's a rule change. You can't file paper anymore. You You've got to have a special procedure in filing in court, obtaining copies. It's gotten to the point where uh, uh, we have to send our, our secretaries and paralegals to special uh, courses almost every two or three months because something new comes up. Try to file something in federal court now. You can't file paper. You have to do it electronically. You have to know just exactly where to file it, how. Rules came out two weeks ago. And filing Court of Appeals, number of words on the page, number of pages, uh, this sort of thing. The courts are getting to the point where they're doing these things to accommodate themselves, not accommodate the, the clients or the public, and they're making it more difficult for the, for the lawyers. To me, all of these electronic ga gadgets Instead of uh, making it more efficient, to me, they made the world a little more complicated. Well, I imagine a lot of people would agree with that. Yeah. Can you, um, Richard, can you tell us a little bit about your family and how, how the practice of, your practice of law affected your, your family? And, and uh, you, family? you haven't mentioned your kids. My you, family you had of a couple law, of, of kids, of, I think. Of lawyers? Yeah. Well, you know. Well, your family, uh, your your family, your children. Oh, my children. Well, fortunately, they both graduated the University of New Mexico. Uh, Paul is now a lawyer on his uh, practicing by uh, alone as a workman comp specialist. My daughter Gina is a graduate of the University of New Mexico. She has a master's degree, and is a psychotherapist with the University of New Mexico Hospital. Uh, Paul has two sons. One wants to be a musician. The other one is an engineer. He's an electronic engineer student in uh, uh, Cal Poly Tech, 
straight A, just made a dean's list. And what uh, I'm proud of is I taught him how to play golf, and he's now a scratch golfer. <laughs> Good. Uh, my wife, Mary, is uh, in, in ill health. I have a health care taking care of her. But one of the reasons I've been able to do all these things is because my family has been very understanding. And uh, I remember when I was first in law school, I had been out of high school, out of school for some years, and I had difficulty in reading because of my eye condition. My wife used to read to me so that I'd be able to go to school. Uh, with, without uh, putting up with me, so to speak, I don't think I would have been able to work as well as I did. Let me tell you about the time I ran for public office, may I? Sure. I was involved as a state treasurer for a governor candidate at one time, <clears throat> and I was, I was told that I'm the only treasurer that ever handled a campaign that came out with a, with a little money, extra money, because you got a straight, you got an accurate account. After that, People kept wanting me to get involved, but I didn't particularly care what I had gone through. It's, they talked me into running for county commission at that time. It was some time ago. I, John Sims, who was former governor, called me and he said, you know, we put you on a ticket. Can we run you for county commission? I said, sure. You know, I thought it was going to be a lot of fun. I attended two meetings. I spent $17.00. I didn't go to any more meetings, anything. But I told Gino, who wanted to finance me, I said, Gino, look, I can't go to these meetings because I can't lie to these people. I'm not going to make the Rio Grande River run in, to, to, back towards Santa Fe. That's what these people are, are, you know, that's what these people are offering. Every time they go to a meeting, they tell people out in the audience what they want to hear for their vote. I can't put up with that. I'm Forget it. I darn near won and scared me to death. <laughs> that was my last venture of being a politician. So now I look at everything these politicians say with a critical eye. Yeah. Um, do you have any um, other um, interests or involvements outside the law, outside of your legal profession? Well, let me tell you my view of... Uh, some of the judiciary and some of our lawyers, if I may. I think they ought to have a, well, another rule maybe, that before you can be appointed to a judge, you have to have some experience as far as trials are concerned and actually court appearances. Some of these judges, I'm afraid, lack that kind of experience, and they're as, they're as novice as some of the lawyers that appear before them who neither of them know, the, and, and they have to learn just like now. To me, law school teaches you what the basic law is. They don't teach you how to be a lawyer, how to be lawyering. And that's, uh, well, you've been through it, and you know that there's a distinction between graduate of law school and being a lawyer. And that's why Bob Curtis tells me, you know, doctors, when they go to medical school, that's why they have to put in the next three years so they'll know how to the, get the experience to be able to do it. And I think maybe something like that ought to happen with lawyers, too, because so many lawyers, and it doesn't work well for the client either because they're not getting that kind of service. Indeed. Um, what what uh, would you say your What's your legacy to the legal profession? Do you feel like you have a, a, any particular well, thing you'd like to be remembered I, for? I, I hope, uh, Kathy, that others will certainly become interested in not only wanting to do things for the state bar. I did them because I wanted to. I did it because I enjoyed it. I did it because I thought it was part of being a lawyer. In addition, getting involved in community affairs. 
I try to talk to the lawyers that are here in our firm now, saying, you know, get, please get involved in doing something for the bar, because if you don't, it, uh, it's not going to progress, and, and it's not only better, best for the, for the legal profession, but certainly for the public and for the clients and for the courts. Uh, if, if some of the things I've done, and I'm especially proud of what I've done for the Medical Com Review Commission and the Medical Society and the State Bar, and I respect, and by 45 years, I worked with the Cancer Society. I had a great deal of satisfaction doing that because I think that that is just as valuable as contributing to the fund. I just hope that uh, lawyers get involved and do some of these things. They now say that, well, it's difficult for me because I'm so busy racking up hours for my salary. Well, I found time to do it. They can find time to do it. Of course, you have to have the help of and understand here your family, but it can be done. I know because I did it. I just hope that other people do it too, especially some of our younger lawyers, and that uh, they can they can add a lot to uh, to society and to the legal profession, and they'll do other thing other than just practice law. Yeah, it enriches your life. It did mine. Yeah, and I would do it over again. Well, that's, that's a good note to uh, conclude on. Thank you. Thank you.